And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Megapnosaurus, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 and Porter Venador. So thank you. This dinosaur of the day also includes Syntarsis and to some extent Coelophysis. Don't worry, we'll get into it. So I guess it's a Coelophysoid. Good guess. Yes. Or good deduction, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We mentioned Megapnosaurus slash Syntarsis briefly in episode 426 because there's a pair of them on display in a diorama at the Natural History Museum of Zimbabwe. Oh yeah, that's how I knew that one. Megapnosaurus, like you deduce, Garrett, it was a coelophysid theropod that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Africa and possibly the U.S. Being a coelophysid, it looked like coelophysis. It had a long tail, it walked on two legs, it had short arms and a long face. And it is similar in shape and size to Coelophysis, small to medium-sized. It's estimated to grow up to 7.2 feet or 2.2 meters long and weigh up to 29 pounds or 13 kilograms. It was lightly built and it was fast. And it had a large brain cavity, so it was probably intelligent, especially compared to other dinosaurs. Based on growth rings that have been found on some specimens, it lived maybe on average seven years. And it may have been nocturnal. There were scleral rings found that looked similar to modern nocturnal birds. It also had a weak joint in its jaw bones, which gave it a hooked premaxillary jaw, the tip of the snout. That sounds very bird-like. It's got eyes that make it look nocturnal, and it's got this hook on the end of its beak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the hypothesis is that it was a scavenger because of that weak joint in the jaw bones. It couldn't go after live prey. Mm, we've heard that proposed before and questioned sometimes mm -hmm. because you know not all prey struggles that much true <laughs> the name megapnosaurus is still being debated whether it's megapnosaurus coelophysis or a new genera completely the genus name megapnosaurus means big dead lizard i love that so much <laughs> there's uh, kind of two species there's megapnosaurus Rhodesiensis, and Megapnosaurus cayentacitae. Again, some paleontologists consider Megapnosaurus to be synonymous with Coelophysis, but that is still being debated. So then it could potentially be like Coelophysis rhodesiensis if they decide that it's, you know, too close to get its own genus, but different enough to be its own species, or it could just get lumped in with a existing Coelophysis species. Won't know unless somebody publishes about it. Yes. I'll start with Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis. Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis was found in the Elliott Formation in South Africa and the Forest Sandstone Formation in Rhodesia, which is now known as Zimbabwe. And it makes sense why you can see one on display at the museum in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis is estimated to be up to that 7.2 feet or 2.2 meter long and weigh up to 29 pounds or 13 kilograms. It's been described as lean and long with an S-shaped neck and long legs that looked like legs of birds, such as the secretary bird. And I loved looking up the secretary bird because mm -hmm. it looks like it's walking on stilts. It's very long legs. It's like flamingo-ish mm -hmm. in terms of the legs. But Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis had shorter arms and four fingers on each hand, and a long tail. There's no evidence that it had feathers, but it's often portrayed that way because it looked so bird-like. Mm. The fossils were first found in 1963, and the holotype includes most of a well-preserved skeleton. It's only missing the skull and neck vertebrae. More fragments have also been found. Several specimens were found in 1985 in South Africa in the Elliott Formation, and 26 specimens were collected in Zimbabwe from the Forest Sandstone Formation in 1963, 1968, and 1972. Wow. So we started out with a well-preserved skeleton, and then they found 25 more. <laughs> That's crazy. But yeah, it's, it's amazing. So we know a fair amount. In terms of where it lived, the Elliott Formation probably was an ancient floodplain. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include sauropodomorphs like Mesospondylus and also Ornithischians like Lesudosaurus and Heterodontosaurus. In the forest sandstone formation, there were crocodiles, Mesospondylus, and indeterminate prosauropods. 
In 1972, Michael Roth found hundreds of bones from at least the 26 individuals from different growth stages. They included skulls and neck vertebrae as well as gut contents. Roth described the fossils in his thesis in 1977, and those fossils from that locality are now at the Queen Victoria Museum in Australia. Some healed fractures of the leg and feet have been found in Megatnosaurus rhodesiensis, and one specimen had signs in the sacral rib of fluctuating asymmetry, which might have been from living in stressful conditions. So some pathologies there. It's possible Megatnosaurus hunted in packs. (laughs) Because they found a bunch of them together, I guess. Yeah, at different growth stages, too. There's also some possible sexual dimorphism based on some individuals just being more robust with the large limbs and the large muscle attachments compared to some more gracile individuals that are smaller in size and all of them are adults. But sexual dimorphism is very hard to know for sure about. Yeah, just like the scavenger versus predator thing, which is interesting because some people said that its jaw was too weak to be a predator and it was scavenger. And then others are saying it hunted in packs. <laughs> So you can see how you can get to different conclusions by looking at the same bones. Yes. Now, there's a lot of variable growth. Like some individuals are larger, but younger or more immature than smaller, mature adults. And it turns out this variable growth was likely common in earlier dinosaurs, but then later lost. Like birds don't do it. That might have helped them, the early dinosaurs, adapt to harsh environments. Yeah, that's not just megapnosaurus. There's a lot of dinosaurs like that. And I wonder partly it could be birds don't do it because they grow so fast. <laughs> yeah, could be. Could be a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. So going into the name, originally Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis was named Syntarsis rhodesiensis by Michael Roth in 1969 based on the Zimbabwe or the Rhodesia fossils. But then in 2001, it was discovered that there was a beetle named Syntarsis. It was mm-hmm. Syntarsis asperulus. So Ivy and others renamed Syntarsis rhodesiensis to Megapnosaurus in 2001. There is some controversy here, and we will get into it. In 2001, Michael Ivy and others, again, they named Megapnosaurus, and they combined Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis, again named by Roth in 1969, and Megapnosaurus cayenta which had been named at this point by Roe. It was named in 1989. The Syntarsis name was already being used for a beetle, and that was named back in 1869 by Fermer. Though two of the authors of Michael Ivey and others, including Michael Ivey, made Syntarsis a junior synonym of a different beetle, Cercanatus, in 1990. But still, the name had already been used. Yeah, that's a bummer. It's like if you use it, even if it's for a really scrappy fossil or it gets renamed or whatever, it's like, that's eh, still preoccupied could be confusing to someone so we can't reuse it yeah although some people have argued like really can beetles and dinosaur bones really get confused but i guess to be on the safe side right and to be consistent with naming conventions yeah it's easier to search for Mm -hmm. sure now according to ivy and others quote this turn of events requires a new name and although centaurus rhodesiensis is described inside the cover of the 1996 volume 3 of the journal centaurus as a small carnivorous dinosaur and although as good and loyal phylogeneticists we understand that it was not really on the lizard lineage at the scale of an entomologist because they were entomologists it looks like a big dead lizard. <laughs> so in what may well be the first name for a dinosaur ever proposed in an entomological journal, we propose the replacement name Megapnosaurus, I quote. <laughs> so it was the entomologist that proposed the new name. Big dead lizard, yes. Oh, that's so funny. They also wrote, quote, this moniker seems highly appropriate for this animal. <laughs> <laughs> It's like beetle people saying like, oh, that's just a big dead lizard. Who cares about it? It's <laughs> the invertebrates striking back against the vertebrates. <laughs> I guess. I guess. I think they were trying to be a little funny about it. They were funny. Yeah. I appreciate the <laughs> But again, there's debates on whether to lump Megapnosaurus into Coelophysis and then to make Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis a junior synonym and it would become Coelophysis rhodesiensis. Gregory Paul, Michael Rath, and others agree that it should be lumped together and synonymized. <laughs> they don't want it to be Megapnosaurus, the big dead lizard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd rather it was a type of coelophysis. 
depending on who you ask. Yeah, it's it's a preference versus other reasons. <laughs> and if you want a refresher on Coelophysis, it was our dinosaur of the day in episode 204. Although it's a little outdated because I was looking at the notes and I had not looked too much into Megatmosaurus <laughs> at that point. Yeah, there's a Coelophysis has been known for so long and from so many specimens. There's a lot to cover. Yes. Now, there were a couple studies in 2018 by Barda and others and by Christopher Griffin that found enough differences to keep Coelophysis and Megapnosaurus separate. As an example, Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis doesn't have a fifth hand bone, the metacarpal, and Coelophysis bari does. It's a pretty big difference. Yes. There's also differences in scars, grooves, and depressions on the humerus and the femur, the arm and leg bones. All right, now I'll move on to Megapnosaurus cayentecate. <laughs> That's a real tongue twister. It is. I'm surprised I got that one that time. <laughs> <laughs> it did feel like I was stumbling a little bit. <laughs> In 1989, Timothy Rowe described a second species of quote unquote Syntarsis as Syntarsis cayentecate based on a skull and parts of a skeleton. These fossils were found in the Cayenta Formation in Arizona in the U.S., and it lived in the early Jurassic. That's what I figured. Mm-hmm. That's how it got its name. Yeah, Cayenta. I don't know about the Cate part. I will get into that. But first, I want to talk about the Cayenta Formation. It had rivers and rainy summers and dry winters, and other dinosaurs that lived there include theropods like Dilophosaurus. Mm -hmm. That's and, why I know it. <laughs> and Cayenta Venador. Huh. Which was originally thought to be Syntarsis cayentecate slash Megapnosaurus cayentecate, but there's enough differences for those to be separate. Really nailing the cayentecate every time. Getting some good practice. <laughs> there's also the shake and bake theropod, which is an undescribed coelophysoid known from a partial skeleton, and it was found in 1978. There's a lot of small bones cemented together in a dense matrix because the fossils had washed down together. <laughs> That's what makes it shake and bake. Yeah. Really. I like that nickname. And then you've got sauropodomorphs like Cerasaurus and Inchisaurus, Heterodontosaurs, and armored dinosaurs like Scalidosaurus and Scutellosaurus. And on the non-dinosaur side, other animals around the time and place included sharks, fish, frogs, turtles, lizards, pterosaurs, mammals, crocodilomorphs, mussels, and snails. Sounds like a swamp. Yeah, it does sound swampy. At least 16 individuals of Syntarsis slash Megapnosaurus cayentecate have been found, fragmentary remains. These fossils were found between 1977 and 1979. Wow, 16. So you not only is the one species really well known, both species are really well known. Yeah. And the type specimen was a fully mature, robust adult. The holotype was distorted. Mostly the left side was preserved because it rested on its left side and was partially buried, but the right side, including the skull, was exposed to water currents. Hmm. So it sounds like it's decently complete, but a little bit messed up. Yeah. Enough to get an estimate that Megapnosaurus or Syntarsis cayentecate was up to 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters long and weighed up to 66 pounds or 30 kilograms. So quite a bit bigger than Rhodesiensis. Yeah, still pretty skinny though, it sounds like. One big difference between Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis and Megapnosaurus cayentecate is that cayentecate had two small crests on its head, similar to Dilophosaurus, but smaller. Huh. Going back to that species name, cayentecate, it refers to the cayenta formation, but also Dr. Kathleen Smith, who has the nickname Cayenta K because <laughs> of her work in the cayenta formation, and that includes finding the type specimen of Megapnosaurus cayentecate. So it's Cayenta K. Mm hmm. Latinized into Cayenta K Te. Yes. <laughs> so maybe it's Cayenta K Te. Oh, could be. I don't know if I can switch my pronunciation <laughs> at this point. Yeah. <laughs> now, whether you use the name Megapnosaurus or Syntarsis depends on who you ask. In 2000, Alex Downs compared Coelophysis bari and Syntarsis rhodesiensis and found them to be so similar that Syntarsis was a junior synonym to Coelophysis. He said there were only minor details in the neck length and other small differences. And I'm saying Syntarsis because this is the year before Megapnosaurus was named, so. Ah, uh, gotcha. In 2004, Anthea 
Christel and Michael Roth synonymized coelophysis and syntarsis as well, based on work on a partially disarticulated skull of a juvenile syntarsis specimen. They said, quote, that the recently proposed facetious replacement name for syntarsis, Gapnosaurus, should not stand, end quote. <laughs> and again, Michael Roth is the one that named syntarsis. Mm-hmm. They found only minor differences and said that those differences could be because they lived at different times, like Coelophysis being in the late Triassic and Syntarsis in the early Jurassic. In 2017, Daniel Barda and others found differences in the hands of Coelophysis spari and Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis. There's that, that fifth metacarpal that I mentioned. In 2018, Christopher Griffin found Megapnosaurus to be valid. There were enough differences between the two, including that there were some characters that varied as Megapnosaurus grew that weren't found in Coelophysis, like a scar on the humerus and depressions on the femur, so things on the arms and legs. Though, they did say that most of the features that changed while growing during ontogeny were the same, and they were similar in size once they were fully grown. In 2020, Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe kept the name Syntarsis rhodesiensis instead of using Megapnosaurus or Coelophysis, quote, because the systematic relationships of these animals within Coelophysoidea is in flux, end quote. Seems like they should have just used Megapnosaurus then. Well, in 2021, Ezker and others found that Syntarsis cayenticate was not closely related to Coelophysis bari or Megapnosaurus rhodesiensis, so that throws another wrench in there <laughs> so they're basically trying to split a preoccupied one into <laughs> and then you've got megapnosaurus rhodesiensis it's like oh man it's a little is, bit messy that's extremely messy and then last year in 2022 sky mcdavid and jeb burgos found megapnosaurus rhodesiensis to be the valid name seems like there's a predominance of it being valid yes well They kind of had, I would say it's valid with an asterisk, according to them. But like I was saying, there's controversy on the name change to Megapnosaurus and whether how it was changed was valid, because some sources said that it wasn't ethically done. According to the 2022 paper, quote, if a taxonomic name is invalid, preoccupied, or incorrectly formulated, then it is considered ethical to contact its original describer or describers to inform them of the problem so that they can correct their own error. If the original describer or describers are unreachable, for example, if they are deceased or do not respond to correspondence, then the person who learns of the error will typically publish a correction. Ivy attempted to contact Roth, but never received a reply. He and co-authors proceeded with publication of the replacement name after two years and after being incorrectly told by dinosaur paleontologist John Jack Horner that Roth was deceased. End quote. So it sounds like there was some miscommunication and they thought maybe the original namer wasn't even around to be contacted. Mm -hmm. The paper also said, quote, the genus Megapnosaurus is here considered to be likely distinct from Coelophysis, but in need of further research. End quote. That's why I say with an asterisk here. Yeah. I mean, I could see being annoyed by a different branch of scientists entirely, basically making fun of your find, Mm -hmm. (laughs) naming it like that. But it is a hilarious name, so I still enjoy it. Yeah. I don't think they were necessarily making fun of it, but, well. They were. It was. (laughs) Big Dead Lizard does sound funny. Yeah. Especially with comparison to beetles and other invertebrates. Yeah. (laughs) Everything's big. Anyway, they... This latest paper found Megavnosaurus rhodesiensis to be correct, but for now, but said that it could possibly be a junior synonym and, quote, usage of the name Megapasaurus rhodesiensis is recommended. Usage of the name Coelophysis rhodesiensis is neither recommended nor discouraged. Usage of the name Syntarsis rhodesiensis is discouraged, end yeah, quote. for sure, because Syntarsis is a different animal, so you can't be using Syntarsis, even though it was synonymized and yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's just, no. Yeah, so, so ruling out Syntarsis, but not completely ruling out Coelophysis. Yep. They also found that Syntarsis cayenticate is most likely its own genus, and they recommend it be provisionally referred to as Megapnosaurus, in quotes, cayenticate, quote, with quotation marks indicating a problematic genus assignment until a new genus is formally described for this species, end quote. Which is why I was saying it's kind of a question mark that there are two species here. Mm-hmm. Or you can do the super weird thing and call one Syntarsis, which you shouldn't be using at all, and the other one Megapnosaurus. <laughs> yeah. But maybe we'll just get a new name sometime in the near future. That seems wise. (laughs) 
There are other fossils that have been found that may be Megapnosaurus, or they used to be considered Megapnosaurus slash Syntarsis. Darlington Muniqua and Michael Roth describe part of a Megapnosaurus slash Syntarsis snout that was found in the Elliott Formation in South Africa, but this one is now known as Draco Venador. Several coelophysoid bones have been found in Mexico from the early Jurassic that were described as, quote, Syntarsis, quote, Mexicanum, but they weren't properly described and they're probably from an indeterminate coelophysoid. Scientists referred a theropod specimen from Wales to Syntarsis, but as an unknown species. And then in 2021, that was later named Pendrag, which we talked about in episode 360. That's kind of a fun name. I remember that one. Me too. In 2004, Randall Ermis reported fossils of Megapnosaurus found in the Lufeng Formation in China from the early Jurassic, two specimens found. And if that is Megapnosaurus, that would mean that Megapnosaurus was also in Asia. Oh, that's messy. Give it a new genus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, Coelophysis is a really late Triassic, early Jurassic dinosaur, so things were pretty well connected back then. But even then, it's unlikely and pretty rare to get those genus that far apart Mm. well we'll see what happens Mm -hmm. for those of you who listen to our dinosaur of the day segment and you like it please consider becoming a patron we take new dinosaur of the day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well so check out our page at patreon.com slash i know dino or click the link on the left 